with everyone. We're going to go ahead and begin our song service this morning, so please find a seat. We'll begin with Tell It to Every Kindred and Nation, number 202, and you'll find the words on the screen. Before we sing, before we sing, if everyone could find a seat, and we'll begin with a word of prayer before we begin our song service. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you for this blessed Sabbath day. Thank you for the opportunity to praise you in song. And we just ask that you would come into our hearts and give us a special blessing now as we sing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, join us in singing. Tell it to every kindred and nation. to proclaim that wonderful news with confidence, as this song says, telling it to every kindred and nation, everyone that we meet. Our next song is going to be 251, He Lives. And this is the reason why we can give that message to the, uh, to the world with so much confidence, is because we have Jesus in our own hearts. This, as the words of this song says, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. So when we have that experience, we will truly be able to share it with others. Sing with us, He Lives, number 251. Voice of 
Good morning. And happy Sabbath again to everyone here. A, f a few announcements. Uh, is anybody glad that we can meet as a group for Sabbath? Yes. Amen. Even if it's outside and it's getting a little warm, it's still nice to be here together. Feels like camp meeting, doesn't it? Remember the old camp meetings used to be under a tent? Those were the, those were the days. So the, all the older folks, we remember those tent camp meetings. Raise your hand if you remember a tent camp meeting. What's that? Yeah, they didn't have nice, nice uh, artificial turf like we have here. Uh, I'd like you now to take out your phone, if you have a phone, and turn it on airplane mode as we live stream the service today. And also request that those on the right side is for the community and on the left is for the campus uh, staff and uh, fa uh, students. Also, uh, if you need to use a restroom, there's restrooms right over here to my right. And uh, if you'd like to uh, remember in the, the past what we do for the service is we ask you to go online and make reservations because we are limited on how many people that we can sit underneath this, uh, this tent. And now then I want to ask also if you're walking around, if you try to wear a mask uh, and uh, stay in uh, your, your family groups as far as possible. Now I have something. Who likes good news and bad news? What do you always want first, the good news or the bad news? Bad news. Want the bad news first. That's, that's kind of the way I am, too. Get the bad out of the way, and then everything's good. It ends on a happy note. Well, here's what we have for the, the sad news. We have some second readings from, from transfers out of the Weimar Campus Church to other churches. And though we don't want to do that, I guess we can request that they uh, make, a, make a motion that they uh, reconsider and decide to stay. But... Uh, at this time, I have some transfers out of the campus church. Uh, Sterling Cornwall and Kayla Cornwall are being tr asked to transfer to the Crescent City SDA Church in Northern California. Nathaniel Jensen to the Ankeny SDA Church. And Eddie Ramirez and Susan Ramirez are asking to be transferred to the Blue Mountain Academy SDA Church. Is there a motion that we allow this to happen? Is there a second? No second? They can't go. They're going to Eddie. I'm sorry. There's no second. You want to make that second, Eddie? Is there a second? Okay. All those can we can sadly say farewell. We'll miss you very much. Now then the good news. We have some members that are be transferring in to the second reading. Omar Alavera and his wife Samantha, Ian Bagad, say it again, Bazgan. There's like different pronunciations for this last name. Melissa Garcia, Leland Crum, Laura Crum, Ruth Crum, DJ Northrup, Nathan Polk, Edward Williams, Calandra Williams, uh, is there a motion that we welcome these into the fellowship of the seventh? I mean, the Seventh Day Adventist, the Weimar Campus Church. Is there a second? Can I hear an amen? Amen. 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 At this time, we'll ask the uh, the song team to come up for our opening song. song this morning is What a Friend We Have in Jesus, number 499, and you'll find the words on the screen. Sing with us, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and please stand.
Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you today that we can have a friend in Jesus, that we can be connected, heaven and earth, through prayer. We're thankful that today you are praying for us. We ask that you would send a rich measure of your spirit that we could hear what we need to hear today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Hello, happy Sabbath. Um, my name's Connor, and I've been asked to do the offering call today. And they told me it was my job to, con well, not convince you, but to inform you on how to do offering. We have a drop box on each entrance, and also there should be a, yeah, there's a QR code on the screen that you can scan. And so now I'd like to share with you a quick verse from Proverbs. Um, it's Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim, with, brim over with new wine. And now I ask that you bow your heads with me as I ask for a blessing for the offering. Dear Jesus, thank you that we could all be here together this Sabbath, and it truly is a blessing and a privilege. Um, we ask that you guide the money that is given today, and we know that we're all just stewards for your money while you determine where it needs to go. Um, thank you for all the blessings you've given to us, and we love you very much. In your name we pray, amen. At this time, uh, we have a children's story, so all you children, if you're out there, you can sit quietly where you're at while Yendi comes up and, and shares a children's story with us. Happy Sabbath. How's everyone doing today? I didn't hear you guys. Happy Sabbath. Okay. As you guys can see, I'm nervous, but <laughs> hopefully I'll do well with the help of God. So quick question. What is the value of this? A hundred dollars, right. It's real. It's real. <laughs> okay, what happens if I fold it in half? What is the value? It's 100. What if I start crumbling it and I start saying, you're worth nothing, nobody loves you, go kill yourself. What's the value there? Still $100. What if I spit on it? Nope, I'm going to fake spit on it. Not real. So, <laughs> spit on it. What's the value now? A hundred dollars. Okay, now let's hope. Okay, what's the value now? A hundred? Didn't you see? I said hurtful words. I drowned it. I crumbled it. It's still a hundred dollars? Why? What doesn't change? The value. Now let me take it out, because then I'm not going to be able to use it later. <laughs> and that's the lesson for today. We are this $100 bill. It's wet, but we are this $100 bill. <laughs> we, we may go through situations where we feel we're drowning with problems in life, where people tell us hurtful words and it affects us, well, it gets to the point where we start comparing each other. 
she's prettier. Oh, look, he looks better. He's already walking down the road and all the girls are looking at him. Like, this person is smarter. I'm the dumb one. Especially if you have siblings, you tend to compare yourself. I can't do anything in life. I'm probably worth nothing. But to God's eyes, we're the most precious and valuable treasure. I want to invite you guys to open up the Bible to Isaiah 49, 15. And I want you guys to highlight these just in case you're feeling down, you're feeling like you're worth nothing. We can go to these. So Isaiah 49, 15 says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will never forget you. So even if you're forsaken by family and friends, you are always cherished in the heart of God. Let's turn to Jeremiah 31, 3. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, Yes, I have loved you with everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. His love for you is immeasurable and infinite. And last but not least, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Who would like to read that? Would a kid like to read it? Child, teen, member of the church? No one? Don't be shy. First Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with vain conversation received by tradition of men, but with a precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. So God was willing to pay the highest price in the universe to redeem you with the blood of his son. So are we valuable? Yes, we are. May we keep these words in our heart. You belong to God. And as long as you cling to him, no one can take that away from you. His word confirms that you're his cherished treasure. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you because you helped me give this story. I was super nervous, but you helped me, Jesus. We ask you and we thank you for giving us the value. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Help us remember that you're always with us even in the worst times. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our prayer song, God Be in My Head. opportunity to come into this tent where we can fellowship with you. Lord, we thank you for being able to be in this outdoor space as a tent, as the children of Israel met in a tent. And the wilderness, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to meet here this Sabbath day. Be with the pastor, Don, as he gives us the message, Lord. May it uh, recomm- dr- drive us to recommit our lives. And Lord, may we leave from here knowing that we've met with you. Please forgive us of our sins and can cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. And just thank you that we can meet with you on this blessed Sabbath day. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. Turn in your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5 and 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and before the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they were virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were the redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And verse, verse 12, here is the patience of sa the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus.
Thank you so much. Wasn't that a blessing? Be still, my soul. And that's probably the biggest problem we have, isn't it? Because our souls are restless until we find rest in Him. And that's what this day is all about, finding rest in Him. Salvation rest, Sabbath rest, ultimately second coming rest. I want to thank uh, Dr. Z for a, a thought-provoking Sabbath school, and certainly how many want to draw closer together at this time when you can't, and yet you can. So um, I just want to let you know we do have a, uh, about 12 elders on this campus, and then of course we also have uh, two Bible workers, and we have all of our teachers that have classes as well. So we want to be more intentional, as we were reminded of this morning, but thankfully we do have a structure in place that is functioning and ramping up again as the school year starts. Um, but it has been a challenge to stay in touch during this COVID time. Let's pray as we begin our, our service today, our preaching section. Father in heaven, today um, all of us come here not because we have arrived or even have the answers, but we come questioning you today and, and making ourselves open to being questioned by you. One answer we do have is that we need help as individuals, as families, as a community, as an institution, as a church and our world, our nation, we definitely see the signs that we need help. And some say that uh, we need to recover the soul of the nation, and others say we need God back in the nation. So we all agree, we need God in our lives today. So we ask that you would come near through the power of your word. The reason we come today is not to hear a man, but to hear your word. And we ask that your word would speak to us today. In Christ's name, amen. The message, the title of the message today is Moral Identity. About a week ago, I was asked by the president of the institution to teach a graduate course for our new psychology Masters, they told me we need to have a course that will focus on the establishing and sharing of moral identity. And uh, we want to have counselors that actually will share the morals and the identity of Christ with their patients and with those they're counseling. We want people to actually talk about God with the people they're counseling and be confident enough to be able to do that. And now, uh, I, <laughs> I did not need another class to teach, to be honest. But the more I thought about it, I said, you know, if I cannot teach a class about that, then I'm a disaster at least I should be able to talk about it. 
And as I began to look at it more and more, and look at what that actually meant in the counseling literature, I realized that that is basically the bottom line, and it's the bottom line at the end of time. Will there be a people who have enough moral identity that it also leads to moral activity? Will they not just talk, will they walk? Will they bark? Will they squawk? So I was reading a dissertation, one of several I read this last week, about this. A foundational desire of evangelical educational institutions is to develop ethical motivation and encourage moral behavior. The mission statements of various evangelical colleges provide examples of the emphasis they place on moral development. For example, Liberty University has stated its desire to build men and women with values. Judson College, to encourage students to embrace Christian ethics for lifelong growth and behavior. Within evangelical educational institutions, moral development is a priority Yet often, an area that C receives little intentional impl imp implementation, and that's what this dissertation was about. In the literature review of the dissertation, there was, or, or right, right after the literature review, there was a, a problem statement that was posited by the author that said this, Adolescence is viewed as a pivotal period in an individual's moral identity development. So that would be academy age, but then all the way through the 30s, this is the primary function, or the primary task of someone to develop their moral identity during this time. College has been called upon to increase both their, colleges have been called upon to increase both their ethical training of students and their research on how to best achieve this goal. Yet, colleges are not succeeding. One recent study reported that 75% of college students confess to cheating. 70% confess to stealing. These are evangelical schools. And 89% confess to lying. So the problem is that there's this goal and lip service to moral identity, but there's, there's, there's not a corresponding activity. In fact, very troubling to me is sometimes I hear even on this campus, well, I know Dr. Nelly told us to give our phones in, but I just turned in a phone, so he thinks I turned in a phone, but I didn't really turn in the phone I use. Just to keep it real, this is not about evangelical schools, this is about this school. Or I, I heard the sermon on the Sabbath, and I under, heard a sermon on Sabbath observance, and I actually saw inspired statements, but then I go out that very afternoon and do something totally against that. That is a disconnect between moral identity and activity. How many of you understand what I'm saying? How many of you understand what I'm just saying? <laughs> no? That doesn't just go for students. This last couple weeks, all over the news, was a guy named Jerry Falwell, Falwell at Liberty University who did not fall well. He fell from being the president of the largest evangelical college in the country one that pictured itself as the Protestant Notre Dame. In an article written by CNN, Jerry Falwell's fatal miscalculation. Now you would expect CNN to really go after Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell's fatal miscalculation. It begins by describing how Jerry described himself. Last fall, 
as scrutiny of his leadership at Liberty University began to intensify, Jerry Falwell Jr. revealed to a CNN reporter one of the secrets of his school's success. He said, our success at Liberty did not start with Jerry Falwell, my father, who built the religious right and, and starred in the old-time gospel hour sermons that then led people together and they said, we want to send our kids to listen to more of that. No, it didn't start with him, said Jerry Falwell Jr. It actually started with my grandfather, who was a bootlegger and delivered moonshine to Virginia hill, uh, hill dwellers during Prohibition. He died when he was 55 with a hip flask in his pocket, an unsaved soul, his grandson said. And what really made Liberty successful is not my father, but my grandfather. Why? He went on to describe at this meeting. My father became a Christian, said Jerry Falwell Jr., but he took the same entrepreneurial spirit into the religious world, and that's why liberty is where it is today. It's successful because of the entrepreneurial business spirit of a bootlegger, which was my grandfather. How many can see any disconnect in that statement? between the moral identity of Liberty University and the statement of the president of the university. And the wheels started coming off the, uh, off the cart, even though he had admitted it's not the gospel hour, it's not the gospel that's given us success, it's the business success. And then he went on, as he was confronted about a picture that was taken on a yacht, by saying this, I'm not a moral leader. My job was to grow Liberty's endowment, campus and student body. I've never been a minister, he told one critic, pointing to his background as a lawyer and a real estate developer. The faculty, the students, the campus pastor are the ones who keep Liberty University strong spiritually as the best Christian university in the world. I'm proud to be a conservative Christian, but my job is to keep Liberty University successful academically, financially, and with athletics. How many beginning to see that the wheels were falling off the cart? Moral identity and moral activity. Am I going to go to a Christian school and then lie? <laughs> and cheat? Why am I here? Am I just here because my parents sent me here? Or why am I here as a pastor? Why am I here as a leader? Notice I'm talking about the president of the institution, not just the students. How many can see that? <laughs> My focus is on academics, finances, and athletics. And then, CNN comments, by most worldly standards, Falwell is a raging success. One billion dollars in new construction, a huge, ben a huge burst in the endowment, but also a cut in the budget of the School of Divinity. Strange, strange to hear the air of the moral majority's founder and leader of a school that aims to train champions for Christ, disavowing the responsibility to live a moral life. And that's when they had this phrase. Moral identity without moral activity they called a fatal miscalculation. <laughs> it is a fatal miscalculation to speak about your moral identity when it's not coupled with moral activity. And in the article they made an interesting comment. Jerry Falwell Jr. was not always like this. He only got like this 
when he got a lot of money. The increase in the money was coupled with a decrease in morality. Some of you might be going to school to increase your money, but just realize it could also decrease your morale. It doesn't have to. But let's look under the hood a little bit more and see Farwell's fatal miscalculation. He thought that because he had grown the campus by $1 billion in construction and the endowment by $1.6 billion, that he was untouchable. And he became arrogant. Someone wrote, Stop this infantile behavior and lead our alma mater with dignity as your father did. You are not honoring your father and your mother's legacy. You're dishonoring. That is at the heart of moral identity. The heart of moral identity is how you re relate to your parents. Why do I say that? I'll remind you of last week's message. The codification of moral identity is found in the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments all start with the name of the Lord thy God. I am the Lord thy God that brought thee up out of the house of bondage, out of the land of Egypt. I got you out of 2,000 gods who had you in bondage. I brought you out of that. Therefore, have no other gods before me. Live a life of gratitude that you're now in the law of liberty. You're living a law of liberty, not a law of Egyptian futility. I brought you out. So live with gratitude. Honor me as our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the second commandment, isn't it? What's the second commandment? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them or serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. I want to protect you from going back into bondage and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and do what? Keep my commandments. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Father. You see, it was dishonoring to not only his father, but to God. Third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of what? So not only when we, we whenever you see something happening in the last five commandments, look at the first five commandments. Are they honoring God? Are they wanting his law written on their hearts? Are they sharing his commandments or other people's commandments? And then what's the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any, thou nor thy, nor thy daughter. In other words, you are so prone. You are so prone to not having your moral identity match your activity that you need to get together every week. Every week on the Sabbath day, as a family and everyone in your group, even the stranger within your gates, and you're supposed to give glory to God the Redeemer and God the Creator and live in accountability to each other, like we learned this morning. Live in close enough proximity that someone is going to say, <laughs> is that the way to act since you've been redeemed? Is that the way to act since you've been created? And then comes the fifth commandment, which is what I was going to talk about, but I just went to the other as a bonus. 
You're not honoring your father and your mother with what you're doing, Jerry. Because fathering and mothering is the mission of the church and any institution. You say, I don't have kids. It has nothing to do with that. <laughs> it has nothing to do with 1 Corinthians 4.15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you don't have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So in other words, what every teacher is to do here is to be begetting people through the gospel. What every person here is supposed to be doing is having that mission. You can't have that mission unless you have that relationship of love for God who did what? Redeemed you. How many of you have been redeemed from anything? I used to curse. I used to swear. I used to drink things I shouldn't have drink. I used to eat things. I still do that somewhat, but I don't try. I used to do these things to a great magnitude. But God has to, I used to have road rage. Yeah. Now, my wife came to the first service. She could give you a list of the things God's still working on. But how many of you know that God has redeemed you in some ways? Amen. And so your life is a life of gratitude. And he's not only redeemed you, once you see redeemed, you look under the hood and you say, oh wait, he created me too. <laughs> so I'm going to trust him. And I'm going to live in a way that actually expands his kingdom through spiritual insemination and propagation. Isn't that what James 1 says? Receive with meekness the implanted word that is able to save your souls. I'm wanting to implant his word in others. So they'll be spiritual children growing up to the glory of God. That's the mission state of the Ten Commandments. So when they said, you're dishonoring them, they're saying, you lost your mission. How many of you are following me? And when you lose your mission, what happens? Thou shalt not kill. You kill people. You hurt yourself. You think of suicide. You think you're not valuable, like our excellent children's story pointed out. You think you're not valuable when God paid everything for you. And then you start doing things like sexual acting out. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And don't get on a yacht with a picture of your pants unzipped. That was in the news last week. I'm glad you don't watch the news. Those of you who had turned in your phones faithfully have not been doing that. That was actually several weeks ago. Because why? You're stealing from someone else. You're stealing from someone else when you do those kind of things. This week in California, they said, we think that minors should be fair game for people that want to have intimate relationships with minors going down to age 12. That's the bill that's on the governor's desk. And that's the legislators who say, yeah, do that. That's stealing. That's sexual confusion. And we're ra being raised in this culture... But don't think it's just the governor. There might be someone that you're taking advantage of even on this campus or who want to take advantage of you. And you're stealing from someone else if you do that and you're stealing from yourself if you allow it. You say, well, I'm not going to marry the person. Then <laughs> That's lying and that's stealing and it's going to hurt you. And when you go on in life, you'll have pain and suffering. And God wants you to have none of it. He doesn't want you to have any of it. And some of us who are older and have experienced some of that stuff say, look, don't go that way. We can tell you that's the wrong way. We're living with scars because of that stuff. It's not just a name. It's not, don't just say you're a Christian out of gratitude, be a Christian. <laughs> don't lie. Don't covet. Be, don't covet. Oh, I wish I had that. I wish I had this. Be satisfied. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. John Piper says that famous 
Calvinist preacher, but a very good preacher. God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in Him. And what are the, what are the commandments that talk about satisfaction in Him? The first four commandments. You know someone's really satisfied when they tell someone how. That's the fifth commandment. Look, I'm going to tell you that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. I want you to have an abundant life. I want you to live a long time. I want you to have everything. <laughs> because that's who I am in Christ, and that's who you can be in Christ. I think it's interesting, I've mentioned it last week, that on the last five commandments, the Lord God's name is not even connected to them. It doesn't say, I, the Lord thy God, say don't steal and lie. He doesn't even want his name associated with that kind of stuff. And if you have this relationship with him, you won't have those things going on. Someone said to me, look, I need my phone. i got to have my phone. Why? Because I'll get bad grades if I don't. Okay. So you lied about your phone, so you want to get good grades? Why do you want to get grades? Well, if I don't get grades, I won't graduate. If I don't graduate, I won't be able to make money. And if I don't be able to make money, oh. You see, anytime you do something on this table, it always points back to something else that's become your God. How many of you understand what I just said? Anything you do something on this table, it always points back to something else that's become your what? Your God. You really want to throw away your salvation for a phone? Lying about a phone. How many think that's it? That was a good one to go down on. I lied about that. No. <laughs> Let's look under the hood a little bit. Talking to Fowell about the moral character of, of another person which you may be able to figure out. <laughs> he said, evangelical Christian theology is about recognizing that everyone is a sinner in need of forgiveness. You can't go by who's sinned and who hasn't because we all have, said Falwell. The ones that you think are perfect and sinless, it's this that you don't know about it. He knew, he knew, he knew about himself, right? You don't know about it. They're all just as bad. We all are. And that's the bottom line. This is the prevalent evangelical Adventist theology. It's not just in the evangelical world. It's in the Adventist church too. Everybody sins. Not a big deal. It's defending your ethics on the basis of which part of the Ten Commandments. The first five or the last five. It's using the last five and saying the very things he says don't do are the things that prove that he's a good God because he forgives me. How many think that's a little twisted? On a whole, another statement, these are all covered by CNN. They listen. On a whole, faith is based on a theology of forgiveness, on the fact that we believe that Jesus taught us that all of us are sinners and we all sin every day. Okay, not only are we all sinners, by the way, if you know you're a sinner, what does that mean? You know there's a God. You know He has a law. You know that the law tells you what's right and wrong, right? You have to know that to say that. Because without law, there's no sin. And you also have to know there's grace if you say that. And you also have to know there's Jesus to say that, right? It's a system. He knows the system, and yet He says in the statement, we all sin every day. There's a mixture here of, yes, the Bible is clear, we've all sinned. The Bible does say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Doesn't it say that? All of us, therefore, stand in need of God's forgiveness. We agree on that. How many of you agree on that? But did Jesus ever say anywhere that we all must sin every day? Did he say that? How many of you believe that you are waking up every day to sin? Well, let's see what the Bible says. 
to the woman caught in adultery and also the adulterers with her because he wrote all their names in the sand. <laughs> so the women and men all caught in adultery. What did he say? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and keep on sinning. Is that what he said? Go and sin no more. Did he mean that? Is there liberty in Christ? John 8, 11. Here's another one. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If, conditional statement, if my people, which are called by my name, identity, first five commandments, right? If they're called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, first five commandments again, right? Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and do what? Not excuse their wicked ways. Turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. The foundation to liberty is humility. And turning away from sin once it's pointed out by the power of God. What's another one? Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. How many want to have mercy? <laughs> How many want your land to be healed? Look at all the promises God gives. This is it. This is true liberty. What did they give Jerry Falwell Jr. for everything he did wrong? Ten million dollars. Severance package. Is that a good message? <laughs> the message is, it's a terrible message. And then this one, read, you can say, with, oh, well, maybe you don't know those. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his, his what? Thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. But what's the stipulation? Forsake the thoughts and return. And then finally, this one you all know. If we, if we confess our sins, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, confessing your sin is not saying everybody sins and they will every day. That's not confession. That's an excuse. And like my dad used to tell me growing up, he who is good at excuses is good at little else. <laughs> Second Timothy 3, 5 says, The last days will be a time when a people will profess a form of godliness while denying the power thereof. And the Advent movement has been raised up to directly challenge that idea. You see, we're not going to be saved by carnal power. We're not going to be saved by government. We're not going to be saved by the Democrats. We're not going to be saved by the Republicans. We're not going to be... And what was Falwell doing? His theology led him to do what? Put a diminuendo on all things moral while putting a crescendo on all things political. You see what happens is when we don't have victory in our lives, we don't become less controlling, we become more controlling with ungodly ways of control. Both parties are doing this. Oh, I will save the soul of the nation. Really? I don't think so. You're a lot of things, but you, you, you're not a savior. How many think we still need Jesus and if you get up and say, I'm going to give you your God and your guns and whatever, you think that guy's going to save you? Absolutely 
categorically not. But what's happening in our nation today is many are drunk with the wine of Babylon who's making fornication with the kings of the earth. An illegitimate church and state is beginning to crop up. Even when Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, else I would fight. And we have to remember, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not carnal. But mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds and imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the glory of God, bringing into captivity every to the O of Christ. That is morality. Not only identified, but personified. How many of you want that? How many of you want that? How many of you are not listening so you don't know how to raise your hands? How many of you want that? I'm getting worried. Now in this dissertation I read, which I thought was pretty good. By the way, from Liberty University. <laughs> not everything's bad at Liberty. And just because one person goes bad doesn't mean everything's bad, like CNN was trying to say. But in this dissertation, they said, look, in helping people establish moral identity, you'll like this, Bill, and Mike, in helping them establish moral identity, you have to do several things. Number one, you have to help them realize an alienation from the culture. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. You have to realize they're in the world, but not of the world. There has to be this drumbeat of alienation from culture. It needs to be counterculture. Culture. Cult. Cult. Where's Darren? Cult. Cult. Cultivate. See, it's like agriculture. You reap what you sow and grow. And what we're trying to do here is have a enculturation that's based on alienation from everything we see in this nation. <laughs> I kind of like that. <laughs> that's our job, planting seeds of dissent and foment. It's a revolution. It's a protest. Godly protest. Now, if you want a master class in this godly protest and how to maintain your identity, like I said in the first service, I would invite you to read Dr. Fodita's book, Preaching from the Grave. I would invite you to read Dr. Fodita's book, Preaching from the Grave. I would invite you to... What did I say? This guy went through the time of trouble. We read about it in the Great Controversy. He went through it. He saw Adventists killing other Adventists. One hospital administrator, one hospital administrator, one hospital administrator. <laughs> Some of you might be in hospital work coming up. And his son invited all the Adventists to the hospital and said, you'll be safe here. Then they called the opposition and said, they're all here. Come and get them. And they came and killed them. Dr. Fuditas went through the time of trouble, and you think, oh, Christian identity issues, you're talking about the evangelicals. No, I'm talking about you, and I'm talking about me. Do we have an identity crisis? Anyway, read that book. <laughs> so what they said is you have to have an alienation from culture. I mean, like it or... Not like it when Dr. Nelly in his class said, Give me your cell phone. That's that's counterculture. How many think that's like counterculture? Like, I don't like that. I mean, I'm addicted to this thing. I mean, I touch this thing more than I'll probably touch any human in my whole life. <laughs> I touch this thing more than I touch myself. 
And you're telling me, take that away? That's like, whoa! Alienation from culture. And by the way, is the internet a connection to all the wonderful things in culture? Well, it's a mixed bag, isn't it? And then secondly, a connection to a higher purpose. The dissertation said, look, you've got to have an alienation from culture and then have a connection to a higher purpose. I'm not going to dental school so I can drive a Mercedes. I'm going to dental school so I can share the gospel with people who have their mouths shut while I talk. <laughs> I'm going to teach them crown him with many crowns. I am going to lead them. I have a higher purpose. You didn't just come to make my payment on my vehicle you came so I can share the gospel with you. If you don't want to come to my dental practice, go somewhere else. But I'll be so kind and loving to you, you won't even feel your teeth come out until I charge you for them. Anyway, so <laughs> I'm kind of working with this dental thing here today a bit. I'm not a real estate agent to try and sell you stuff so I can exploit you which is where all the money came from for Stanford University, who killed all the Indians and stole their real estate and then started Stanford University. No, I'm not that. I'm here as a real estate agent to interest you some property upstairs. You must have a higher purpose. We aim far too low, far too low, you know, people that, they, look, they've studied it. You, you get so much money, there's a point where you don't get any more happiness the more money you get. That's why we're going to take up an offering right now, just in case you're in that category. But, <laughs> so, there's a point where you just do not get happier with money. In fact, the happiest places I've ever been is like mission trips where they had no money. They're all singing, ah, the mission trip was for me, not them. So, alienation from culture, number one. Two, connection with a higher purpose. And then number three, admiration of a moral individual. People need heroes today, not zeros. They need people that are not talking about how they get away with sin and that's okay and we're going to do it every day. They want to talk to people that, by God's grace and His power alone, not through their works, have actually seen victory in their life. That's what they want to talk to. What did I tell you? Colleges are not succeeding. 75% of college students have confessed to cheating. 70% confessed to stealing. 89% confessed to lying. Well, it's about time to wrap up, but I want to give you a couple texts before we wrap up. We got to talk about a higher ideal and a higher purpose as we leave. How many of you want to have a higher ideal and a higher purpose that is so gripping that you say, I, I need that. Well, check out Zephaniah 3.13. Let's crack it open. Zephaniah 3.13. I remember once when I was in the seminary, I thought I was going to do a paper on Zechariah, but I accidentally put in, turned in Zephaniah. It was much shorter. And I was thankful for my error after I did that. And now I can't even find it, it's so, forth, so short. Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai. Okay, here it is. Zephaniah 3. Verse 13. Well, let's do, do verse 12. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. What is that? 
First five commandments. Name of the Lord is associated with the first five commandments. And then what's it say next? If you have the name of Yahweh in your life, in your forehead, the remnant of Israel shall do unrighteousness every day. They can't help it. Shall, shall do what? No unrighteousness. And speak how many lies? No lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. And they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Fearlessness in the midst of an alien culture. Fearlessness. Because God has so changed their lives. They're humble. They're meek. They said, look, I'm not going to write my own law. You write your law on my heart and on my mind. God be in my head and in my thinking. God be in my eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my heart and in my standing under or my understanding. And here's a point that I just learned this last week as I was thinking about this. You know, we teach people as counselors, well, I'm going to teach you cognitive behavioral therapy. It's very simple. We're going to take your thoughts and we'll just turn them around. We know how to do this because we understand your mind is beautiful, but it'll be better once we get through with it. And we teach them all these procedures. Now, I'm not against those procedures, but those are things that can be understood. But my Bible tells me that God, when he comes into my life, can actually give me a peace that passes understanding. Can you say hallelujah? So while I might be able to help you by confronting you, there are going to be some things no one can explain. It's a miracle. Look at what happened in his life. Look at what happened through his life. Look at this. That's not him. And that's not any technique he learned. And that's not ten cognitive distortions he learned about. Except for the ten distortions that are addressed by the Ten Commandments. I'll write my law in your heart and your mind. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. I will walk in you. It even says that. How many think that you need that miracle? First Thessalonians 5. By the way, Revelation 14, our scripture reading, it says they have no guile in their mouth. It goes along, right along with Zephaniah 3.13. Now back to the Thessalonians. By the way, the book of Thessalonians, every single chapter of 1 Thessalonians ends with a picture of the second coming. He's coming again, he's coming again, he's coming again, he's coming again, he's coming again. Every single one. But notice how it ends in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And by the way, are you looking forward to Jesus coming? Amen. Do you love his appearing? I was talking with a kid this last week. I don't want Jesus to come. It's going to be scared. There's going to be a time of trouble. I said, look, this whole world is a time of trouble. We're trying to get out of the time of trouble. That's why we want Jesus to come, not to go through the time of trouble. We want to get out of the time of trouble. The only time I didn't love my dad's appearing when he was coming home was when I was watching the TV. Do you remember this, Mom? And I stole the cord. He had this cord to this little black and white TV. And he said, I'm taking it with you because I don't want you watching the TV when I'm gone. Well, I got myself a cord. That's the first cord I ever got. I got this cord. And then I was watching TV. And I got so in, 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 immersed in the Flintstones that when he came home, yabba dabba do, I did not, I did not hear him driving up. And then he comes in, and I, just before he came in, I pulled the cord out. I was like, whoa, and I, I'm standing there like guilty. <laughs> Might as well just go to jail. <laughs> standing right there. And he goes, hi, Dad, how you doing? Uh, why are you saying that? You never usually talk to me even. <laughs> uh, what do you have behind yourself? I said, uh, you know, window, TV, what do you have behind yourself? He turns around. Ah. <laughs> I'm lying, I'm lying. Then he comes over and he puts his hand on the television. <laughs> and I was toast. <laughs> you see, when you're doing something wrong, you don't love the appearing of your parent, and you don't love the appearing of Jesus. 
How many of you love His appearing? You, wa- you can sing the song, Be Still and Know. And you don't have that guilt that comes from whatever it is. Okay, let me read the text. Here it is. 1 Thessalonians 5. Now may the God of peace, verse 23, Himself sanctify you except for once a day when you sin. Is that what it says? Sanctify you what? Completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many can say, God, do it? I don't know how you're going to do it, but I want you to do it in my life. I want my identity have, to have corresponding activity that I only give you glory for. Revelation 2 and 3, every single church. We're going on a tour of the seven churches next year with Dr. Z. The reason we're going there is to see where people became overcomers. Every single church, it ends with, these are the ones who overcame. They overcame. They overcame. They were not overcome. They overcame. We get that word. These are not like the Nicolaitans. Nick, Nike. We have Nike, you know, to overcome. They're not like them. They overcame. And thus it's granted to sit down on his throne. Revelation 3.21. Hallelujah. Do we need heroes? How many think we need heroes? How many want to be one of those heroes by God's grace? All the way through Revelation. This is picture. Now I want to just close because I, I got more. I got three more pages, but I might go on through. Maybe that's the best person. <laughs> I want to close with something that's very, this touched me this last week. A week ago, our president, Dr. Nelly, and his wife Erica, who I've known since I was, I don't know, 16, 17 years old, they got this word based on an x-ray, series of x-rays that Eric and Nedley had, who had recently had liver cancer, had, had cancer come back, and they thought that it was, they saw a big mass, and it was all the way up to her aorta and different lymph nodes. And Dr. Nedley came into the leadership room last week, and he was weeping. As he told us that Erica was going to die. And I don't think there was a dry eye in there. He told about her character. (laughs) He said she didn't just say things. She always was doing things. She never wasted a moment. And by the way, how many of you have ever seen Erica? She's like a tornado. And he said, she did all that so I could do what I'm supposed to do. She said, don't do those things that I can do for you so you can do what you need to do and what God's called you to do. And that's exactly, how many of you want to have someone say that about you? While you're alive. And I thought that was it, you know. I thought, that's it. She's, that's it. We prayed. I, I remember the prayer. <laughs> Lord, thank you for this reminder that without you, we can't do anything. That we're powerless. But thank you also for the reminder in this room that there have been people, even in this room, who had cancer that you healed. And then I named the people. And Lord, would you please heal our sister Erica as well. You see, it's at moments like these where we question what our relationship is. Also in the prayer, I said, oh God, forgive us from sins that would 
not allow our prayer to actually be even heard. And that's the whole point of that chapter in prayer for the sick and ministry of healing. And that chapter is based on the book of James that says if you're double-minded, nothing's going to happen. Chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And the whole chapter, all whole the book of James is how to have yourself have identity that's connected to reality. So we prayed that prayer. I, I didn't expect to hear anything for until, but I couldn't help it. I texted Dr. Nelly in the afternoon and he said, Look, let's get together on a Zoom call. And when he got together on that Zoom call, he said, and I think he wrote you an email, some of you. He said, the doctor could not believe what she was seeing. She found no cancer. She doesn't know what happened. Looks like cancer on all these films. She saw it's none that, uh, that she could see. They still have to have the test come back. There's a 5% chance there might be something there. But there certainly was not what they thought they saw. How many can say hallelujah for that? Hallelujah. But the thing that really touched me was this. Dr. Nelly made some statements that were the exact opposite of Falwell's statements. He was very transparent. And he said, you know what? I have not been praying like I should. And I want to rededicate my life to prayer. I want to dedicate my life to time with God. I want to dedicate my life to use every day I might have in the future for His glory. I want my identity to totally match my activity. Why did He say those things? Because of love. Because of love. He thought he had lost the human love of his life. And he reviewed the godly things in his wife's life. How many of you want to be a wife like that? That leads your husband to recommit his life to God? How many of you want to be a husband like that? that leaves your wife to rededicate her life to you? How many parents like that that lead your kids to see you as a hero of the faith? How many of you kids want to be students like that? That people can just sense that. You know what the research said? It's not enough to talk about it. There was a president here that left the church, became an atheist, and he studied moral development. Every single time I looked at the minutes, he was talking about Lawrence Kohlberg. Now they've crit critiqued Lawrence Kohlberg, and this is what they said. Lawrence Kohlberg had a lot of things to say about moral development that were wrong. And the biggest thing that was wrong was he thought you could just talk about it without doing it. And I thought, praise the Lord that we're doing stuff like TCI. Praise the Lord that we're going to do more things like that when we have a trail. How many of you would like to send people on a sanctuary tour and tell them about the sanctuary like 6,000 times before you leave school? You're walking, you're talking about it, you're not just saying, you're doing How do you want to have that situation? Not just saying, but doing But I'm telling you, that touched my heart. And here's the reality. If I give my heart to God, first five, well, first five commandments, in gratitude, realizing what he's done, not so I'm trying to manipulate him. That doesn't work. That which is not of faith is sin. It's actually a sin to go to church on Sabbath. You're doing it because you think you're going to not be lost as a result. That's a sin. It's a sin to do anything religious if it's not based on true faith. So lots of religious people are sinning. 
How many of you understand what I just said? Because that which is not of faith is what? Sin. So how many of you in faith desire to have God come into your life, to give you that gift of faith, even faith? And so I identify that truly, no matter what happens, I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor principalities, nor powers, nor rulers of this world, I am persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love that is in Christ Jesus. I did not for one moment sense in our president's voice or tone that he was separated from God in any way. And I did not pick up at all that his confidence would have been any different had the outcome been different. Because we believe in a God who raises even the dead. How many are looking forward to him coming? You have a new body. You have a new mind. You'll see the people that have died, they're resurrected. Let's sing together. God will take care of you. That'll be our last song. And then we'll pray after that. God will take care of you. As we identify with him, he will, in fact, take care of us. Let's sing together. Number 99, God will take care of you. Let's stand. instead. Test him. Will he take care of you if you don't have a cell phone? Will he take care of you if you don't study on Sabbath? Fourth, all you may need, verse 3. All you may need, he will
pray, I just want to mention that tonight we have Vespers at 630. 6.30. And our elder Kirk, we, are, we cycle through all our elders. It's good. You need to get to know our elders because you actually are divided as church members into parish groups under them. So if you perish, it's their fault. No. <laughs> so, but they don't want that to happen. They're, they're, they're watching over the flock. So Saturday nights we have family Vespers, and it's not mandatory for students, but it certainly would be laudatory, and it certainly would be helpful to come as well. Do you have something to say about what you want to talk about? No, I just want to say one thing. When I was at uh, Union College, it was in the early 80s, that kind of dates me, but I was feeling a little bit, uh, a little bit down. I had gone through a lot in the week, and so I went to the College View Church. College View Church, has anybody been in Lincoln, Nebraska? It's a big church large church. And I went there, and it was a Saturday night. I wanted to uh, usher in the sa- uh, close out the Sabbath before I went and did, you know, the next week's activities. And when I got there, what struck me was I walked in, there was less than five people for Vespers on Saturday night. And I was shocked, but it really touched my heart. It, it spoke to me, and that's why I think it's good that we have uh, to close out the Sabbath tonight at 6.30. We're going to have a, a lot of the students here from the campus doing music, but if you, you're welcome to come, Uh, But I think it'll be a blessing to close out the Sabbath day. Amen. Let's pray together as we close. Father in heaven, today we've covered a a most vital topic that's near to your heart. You've done everything to identify with us. You came, you lived, you died, you ever lived to make intercession. You're doing everything you can. You even have our same genetics. You came to identify with us in the hopes that we would see your love and identify fully with you. And may we do that, not through just word, but also action today and this week. In Christ's name we pray.